Good morning, good morning. morning. You made it to church. There's people in the courtyard still standing up, so I'm just asking. Find your seat, find your seat. Glad that you're here at Gateway. We're glad that you're actually taking the effort, and I know for some of you it's a lot of effort, to get out of your seat and say hi. I know I struggle with social anxiety, and every time people start coming to church, I get nervous. So I figure I'm the pastor here, so I know there's some of you who feel the same way. So uh, do you believe that God is good? Good. Open your Bibles to Psalms. You've been seeing them on the screen, right? Psalm 23, perhaps the most well-known scripture, really, in all of the Bible. Psalm 23. And uh, if you don't know your Bible, you just go to the middle of it, and you turn to the left a little bit, and you're in Psalm or Proverbs right there somewhere. You'll find it. If you've got an iPhone or a phone, a mobile device, you can go and download the YouVersion Bible app. On the app is our, also our notes for the sermon under the events tab. You can see Gateway Bible Church. You'll see the notes right there in the sermon, be able to take notes right along with this. Well, the enemy would love to keep you from believing that God actually is good. And in fact, some of you today, you're questioning, perhaps, is God really good? I mean, I know that he's good and that someday he will wipe away every tear. I have that promise. But what I'm experiencing in life right now, I'm not sure that he's good. I'm really not sure. And it's hard to reconcile and believe that maybe God's goodness uh, is really there when given your current circumstance or your experience. Sometimes it seems like God, if he were really there and he was really good, things would be really different in your life. Have you been there? A lot of people wonder, how can I believe in God's God's goodness when life around me seems so bad? So it's just good to introduce this this morning with that tension as we look through the 23rd Psalm. Psalm. Some of you here who've come this morning, I know because you've told me about it, you have chronic pain in your body, and you have (laughs) prayed over and over again, God, take this pain away. Look, I know at my age, I have pain just from sleeping. (laughs) Do you know how that works? You wake up in the morning, what did I do? But some of you have worse pain than that, and you've asked God to take it away, and you've had other people pray for you, and nothing's happened. Parents, there is no pain like kid pain. Some of you have a prodigal child, and you've been praying for years that this child would come home to Jesus, yet not an answer to that prayer has shown up, and you're heartbroken. Some of you are walking through loss, The loss of a spouse, you miss their voice, you miss their touch, and yet God doesn't answer the prayer to bring them back, and you're heartbroken. Maybe there's brokenness in your family. It doesn't seem to be any kind of hope of restoration within the family. Oh, look, you got your shower this morning, and you look pretty on the outside, but on the inside, you're a mess. And I want you to know that Jesus is here to meet you today with his grace and his mercy through this psalm, Psalm 23. Uh, I want to remind you that what you see right now in life is not the complete picture. You see, the Bible says, through a glass dimly. You will have a, a tendency to put a period where God puts a comma. And right now is not the rest of your life. It's just this season of your life. There's a greater picture to be seen. Now, I grew up in a time where I watched PBS on Sunday morning. Do you know what that is? Okay, if you're old like me, you know what that is. Once the cartoons were over on Saturday morning, you saw this guy, Bob Ross. Do you remember him? (laughs) Bob Ross. Bob Ross would get on, and he would, like, amazing artist who would, like, talk through his paintings, and everybody then would think that they could paint like him. I mean, I got my color crayons out, and I was trying. But I couldn't understand. Like, Bob Ross would put, like, this blob on the screen. And then he'd start saying things like, oh, look at that. Let's see what we can do with this. Oh, this is a, it's a beautiful cloud. Look at this beautiful cloud just smiling back at you this morning. Look at that. And you're like, what is he seeing? This guy's on something because I don't see a cloud. <laughs> and then with just a few strokes of his brush, it would turn into this beautiful cloud. And then mountains. And then trees. And you're dumbfounded somehow in that 30 minutes that he was able to do such an awesome painting. And that's how all of his paintings would go. What seemed to be just blobs of paint, miraculously, he would take them into the beautiful canvas of a picture. And this is what God is doing in all of your lives. He is taking what seems to be to you a random blob of an event that doesn't feel so good, and he's 
making beautiful things that you will see if you'll just hang in there. What seems to feel pointless and random actually is the work of God working in you and through you. Can I get an amen for those who've been there? That's right. The problem comes, again, where we put a period. We say, that's it. But God says, no, that's not it. So just say it with me. It ain't over. It ain't over. They used to say, when, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. I know that's not appropriate today, but it ain't over. I said it. Every book in the Bible, listen, it, it records struggles of people trying to understand why God isn't doing something they want him to do. Every book. That's what the context of Psalm 23 is all about. It's the testimony of a man, his name is David, who learned to experience God's goodness in a time of difficulty and chaos where life was upside down. That's what's good for us. I know for some, we think of Psalm 23, and it's like this pithy little psalm that we uh, say to our kids, and maybe we hear it once in a while at a funeral. But David is really struggling with God's goodness. In fact, this is a time of gritty difficulty in his life. And we see that David, in his life, the context is he was on the run. Listen, his life was in danger. He was being chased. We don't know exactly in this time, but we do know from the circumstances around the psalm that he was, he was sometimes hungry, sometimes even thirsty, needing the essential things in life to survive. His boss <laughs> had thrown a spear at him, right? He was hunting him down. His wife was gone. His friends had betrayed him. He was brokenhearted. He was disappointed. And yet, he was there in the presence of enemies, walking through the valley, the darkness, the shadow of death. Psalm 23 is not to meant, meant to be a bedtime story. It's meant to be an encouragement to you and to me. So are you ready to get into it? Remember this about Psalm 23. It's a metaphor. Everybody say it with me. A metaphor. David was a shepherd, right? He was a shepherd, and so he's writing about what God does with sheep, and he understood that because that was his job. And what he did with the sheep, God has done with him, and so he's giving this description of what that looks like. So let's just a quick questions here. Anybody here have shepherding in your gift set, your skill set, like in job? Have you ever shepherded sheep? Anyone here? You have. Thank God for you. I will ask you questions later. Anyone else in the courtyard, you've done some shepherding, right? You know what that's like. Anybody in 4-H? Okay, so we know 4-H, right? It's a little closer to that. Some of us understanding a little bit about animals and specifically about shepherds. Check out this video. It's just a little video here for you to see. Like, notice where the shepherd is and the sheep are kind of being drawn towards the shepherd. And this is what shepherds do. They spend time with the sheep. They're hanging out with the sheep. Here's what you need to know. There's a little bit of bad news about sheep. Sheep are pref the preferred metaphor for us as God's children. What that means for us, sheep are some of the dumbest animals in the farm, right? <laughs> sheep are simple they're needy, and they're fearful. Sheep are simple, they're needy, and they're fearful. You need to know that. Again, fearful, why? They're skittish animals. They will run at any thought, even, or just because somebody else is running. That's what sheep do, right? I know this. Sheep will eat anything. They used to eat the quarters I would hand them. I don't know how that works in their stomach, but sheep are amazing, they would, they would, again, follow each other even off of a cliff. It's been known that they would follow each other into deep water and drown. Again, one running for no reason, no reason at all. They don't have any defense systems really to speak of. So what do they do? They huddle together hoping that the people, the, the, people, the sheep on the outside would get uh, eaten by the predators. So they try to stay on the inside. That was their Defense mechanism. Kind of reminds me of a story about two guys who went hiking in the Sierras, right? They're hiking on this trail. They run into a bear. Suddenly, one guy jumps down, and it starts tying his shoes. The other guy says, look, you're not going to outrun this bear. He says, I don't have to. I just got to outrun you. That's kind of like sheep, right? Their, their only defense system was their wool, the thickness of their wool. Again, as we look at sheep, I want you to think about this. They would often not even know where to go to eat. They would often defecate on their own food. They would often trample down the things that they were supposed to be eating. So they needed to be brought to new grass. They needed to have greener pastures. Uh, again, 
For some reason, if a sheep falls over on its back, it can't roll over on its own. It's called cast. When the sheep is cast, they just fall over and they just lay there. Kind of helpless. They're, they're not like cats either. Cats are constantly cleaning themselves, licking with their tongue, and then giving you kisses. Nasty. <laughs> but, but sheep, sheep are just dirty. They don't have any way to clean themselves. And they pick up all kinds of parasites really easily. They're also incredibly nervous animals. They're very fearful, fidgety, waiting for something to ha happen. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Just wanted to see if you were listening. Over 200 times the Bible refers to God's people as sheep. So sheep, would you say they're fitting comparisons to human beings? Okay, turn to the person next to you and say, not me. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to also see that the good news is that we have a shepherd who loves to lead sheep who are dependent upon him. The shepherds provide leadership and protection and direction. We'll go into some of that this morning. He leads them, again, new grazing grounds. He gives them clean water to drink. He watches out for their health, parasites, and other things. So it's, Psalm 23 tells us all about what this looks like. And David is confident in God in the midst of the chaos going in his, on in his life. So I want you to see what David shows us, how we can be confident in the middle of chaos in our life. So verse 1, we're finally there. You ready? Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Really important that you underline my. The Lord, Yahweh, L-O-R-D, capitalized in your Bible? Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. I lack nothing. Right? What's the uh, King James Version? Come on, you King Jamers. I shall not want, right? <laughs> I, can you say this in your life right now that you lack nothing? Can you say it that you feel secure, that you feel satisfied, that you are happy with the things are with the way things are right now in your life? Circumstantially, can you say that? Many read these words and they think that David is actually out of touch with reality because we live in a world with real world problems. You see it every day. You're experiencing some of them. Keep in mind that David had all kinds of problems. It's hard for us to imagine, but he had a broken heart. He had unfulfilled dreams. He had unanswered prayers. So how can David say, I lack nothing? The key is verse 1 again. The Lord, that's present tense, is. Everybody say is. Is. He's right now my personal. So it's present tense and my personal Shepherd, right? Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's where that comes from, my shepherd. Jehovah Jireh, literally, he is the I am that I am. That's what Jehovah, that's what Yahweh means. The Jewish people would use the, the, the word Jehovah whenever they would see Y-H-W-H. -H. They translate it Jehovah. We would see it as an unsayable name, so holy, so otherly so otherworldly, so transcendent. He's the biggest picture of God that we can get our arms around is this word Yahweh. He says, I am before all else. I am all sufficient, Yahweh. I am self-sufficient. I am holy. I'm above. I have unlimited resources. I am outside of time. I am eternal. I am Yahweh. But then notice the contrast. The Lord is not the shepherd, but he's my shepherd shepherd. This may be, for the Hebrew mind, the most intimate personal term they could ever use, my shepherd. They understood that kind of relationship. Today, we don't, because we don't live in an agrarian culture. The closest we get is Watsonville, right? And it's strawberries and, and things like that and artichokes, but we don't see people herding sheep around. They would have understood that the shepherd provides and he protects and he cares for and he understands and he nourishes and he, he loves his job. It's a lowly job. It's a serving job. But this is what the shepherd does. So here, in the first line, you have God's transcendence, his bigness, his greatness, his power, and his eminence. And, and yet you have his tenderness and his care and his closeness, his into me you see, his intimacy. 
to God, his people, they're vulnerable, yes, like sheep, but they're also extremely valuable, extremely valuable. He places high value in all of us. And I want you to see that he makes the first three statements in future tense. I will lack nothing. In future tense, David understands something. He had been in fear. He had been in chaos and crisis. He had been uh, upside down in his life, and yet he understands the secret to having confidence in God. And what that is, it's not putting your dependency upon your income or your talent or your treasures or your intelligence or even your family or even your spouse. God was David's source. This is so huge for you to get on the front end of Psalm 23. The Lord is, say it with me, my shepherd. This is the secret to having chaos in the, I mean, so having calm in the midst of chaos. He's saying, put God as your source and he will provide your resource. Put God as your source and he will provide the resource. You may be faced, listen, today with the biggest challenge of your life. You got cancer, cancer in your body. The doctors have told you, you know, the prognosis is not good and you're scared. Maybe your spouse has said, I am done. And you're even more scared. Or maybe you're just angry. Maybe you're just sad. And most days you're angry and sad. All of those together. Maybe again, you've been let go of your job and you don't know what the future holds for you and you can't find work. Maybe there's, again, a family fracture. Relationships are shattered. Doesn't seem to be any hope. Listen, none of those circumstances are going to give you life. None of them. You don't have the resources to overcome them. This is when you begin to understand, I am a sheep. So like David, put God as your source, and he will provide the resource. Whatever you're faced with saying, I'm not going to be uptight right now. I'm not going to go flip out on somebody else because I'm trusting the all-knowing, the all-powerful shepherd, and he will provide. That's what Jehovah Jireh means. Verse 2, God my provider. Verse 2, he makes, everybody say he makes. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me, say he leads me. He leads me beside still quiet waters or still waters, some of your translations. He refreshes or he restores my soul. Let me ask you, when, when sheep are by green pastures, what do they do? They eat. Sheep eat when there's green pastures. When sheep finally lies down, why do they lie down? They're full. He makes me lie down in green pastures. David is saying here, David is full of God's presence. He's full of God's goodness. And because he's been feasting on God's presence and who God is... He can now rest. He can now lie down. Why? Why can you do that? Because God, listen, God is committed to meeting your physical, your spiritual, your emotional needs. He refreshes your soul by meeting your physical, your spiritual, emotional needs. He does all of these things. That's why the verse 2 says he makes. And some of you, because you're busy bodies and you got to do something, sometimes he'll put you in a situation where he makes you lie down. He leads me. You let him lead you into these places, these quiet waters where God can be the source of strength for you. Green pastures. See this picture here with this other shepherd. Green pastures, right? It looks so lovely and wonderful. You know, being a shepherd must be hard work because it's 24-7. You don't go on breaks. You're with your sheep all the time. Pretty lonely. We're just hanging out with sheep. How do you communicate to your sheep? You learn a lot about your sheep, and you lead them to the place where they can drink these quiet waters to restore them, to give them a refresh, if you will. These are all things that the shepherd uses to care for your needs. You may be drained today, but he might have to set his hand on you to get you to lay down before he fills you up again. That's what refresh is all about this series. And he gives you the ability to get up, get up and keep going even when you have a broken heart, even when you have a disappointed dream, even when you have an unmet yearning that's inside you. This is a theme throughout the Bible. Some of you remember the Old Testament, right? That's kind of what we're in now. But if you look through the Old Testament in Genesis, we saw that the Israelites went through what was called the wilderness. 
And there God provided for them in a unique way. Do you remember what it was? Manna. Manna, the name is, what is it? They, what is it? They didn't know what it was. That's why the name was manna. What is it? That's actually what it was translated. Manna is, what is this? <laughs> and so every morning they would go out like dew on the ground and they would collect manna, right? They, would, they, they couldn't collect though for leftovers. Like it only lasted 24 hours and then it would go bad. You couldn't put it in the freezer later for like uh, leftovers in a casserole and call it manna cotti. You couldn't do that. <laughs> You, you couldn't put it in the cupboard somewhere and pull it out later for some banana bread. <laughs> you couldn't do any of those things. But it would last for 48 hours on the Sabbath. Interesting. God provided daily their daily bread. Jesus, when he feeds the 5,000, is another picture of this, five loaves of fish, five loaves and two fish, right? This is foreshadowing God's presence and his presence with them. He says, my flesh is the bread that came down from heaven. Interesting. There's a connection. When we feast on him, that seems like weird, feasting on Jesus, his presence and who he is, we can become full even when we're in the wilderness, even when our bellies are growling. We can be full of him. That's what fasting's all about, by the way. There's no other God but him alone, including food. So again, there's uh, another picture here. Uh, I, of sheep actually being led. I think that that's what I'm showing you here. This picture of sheep being led. When they, when they, what do sheep do when they're by still water now? They said green pastures. What do they do by the still water? What do they do there? They drink. They drink because they're thirsty, right? Again, uh, green pastures and still waters are pictures that God is saying he will meet your needs. He doesn't always meet your wants. How many people know that? I got a lot of wants, but he can meet your needs and he will meet your needs. There's a great book, an old book actually, by Philip Keller, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. Somebody borrowed that from my library. Could you bring that back? Anyway, the biggest problem for sheep is that when they fall down, again, they go cast. This is the problem. When they, they, they lie on their back, they fall down, they, they, their legs go straight up, and they've got to get back on their feet again. The only way they can get back on their feet again is somebody comes along and helps them up. If they don't, then a predator comes along and they're Say it with me. They die. Okay. And so the shepherd stands them back up. But the important part, he says, Keller says in this, is that he, he actually massages the shepherd's legs so that they don't fall over again. Shepherd's sheep. Okay, sheep's legs. Maybe the shepherd needs that too. It's a long day. I'm just saying. It would be a little weird to see your sheep massaging your shepherd, but you got the idea. Who is this guy teaching anyway? David is saying, this is what the Spirit does with me. He's getting me ready again to stand. By the way, when are sheep most likely to go cast? I don't know. I'm not a shepherd. I have no idea. Well, first of all, when they're laying around on the soft, comfy spots in the field and they roll over too far. Secondly, when they have too much wool. Top heavy. Boop. Or when they're just too fat, they step in a hole. And they fall over, and they can't get up, right? Again, for us, we think that the good life, the fat and happy life, is the good life, right? But often, the quickest way that we can lose contact with the shepherd is when we get too full. It's when we have too much wool, when we have a little too much fat. And so God oftentimes allows circumstances to come into our lives where that gets taken away so that we would depend on him. And so that we wouldn't fall over, we'd get sheared. We'd get a little cut here and there. Many of us here, listen, in this room, if you doubt that, there are many people here, people usually with gray hair, and that's a lot of us, right? right you've experienced this. The closeness of God that you've experienced in your life, the closest time, has not been in time of plenty. It's when you've needed him the most. Where is that amen, folks? Come on. Some of you young people need to hear this. God is with you, especially so, his presence, in the lowest valley. He guides me along the right paths, it says, for his name's sake. Sheep are creatures of habit. They go through paths. They will go around in the same path if you just let them. And again, they'll soil their own food with manure. 
Then parasites get in that, contaminants. So the shepherd leads them to new paths, paths that they're not familiar with, paths that they have to actually uh, follow the shepherd on because it's brand new territory. The shepherd is trailblazing for them. And some of you need to hear this. It's so that you could experience God in a new way. You could experience new things in a new way. And this is the path of dependency, dependency on him. On occasion, a sheep would wander away from the fold. Maybe you've heard the story that what would happen to the sheep that continually wandered away? The shepherd would take the sheep, break its leg, and put it on its back. Why would he do that? That seems cruel. I'm calling SBCA or somebody. Cruelty. Now, he would do that because the sheep would need to know the shepherd's voice and learn not to wander because we're prone to wander. And over time, in three months or so, that leg would heal And over time, that sheep would get attached to the shepherd and vice versa. And that sheep would never wander again. Close to the shepherd, more close, they say, some than the dog. Okay? He guides me in paths of righteousness. He redirects your life down the right path. What is the right path? (laughs) His path. Well, what is his path? Where do I find that? His word. Okay, we're a Bible church. Do you remember that? You came into a Bible church. So we look at the Bible for God's will. God's will is found in his word. It reminds me of a story of a couple who came here, and they said, we want to do marriage right. First thing I asked, are you living together? Yes. Are you sleeping together? Yes. Thank you for your honesty. Now, go home, separate, go back to your houses, and I'm pretty sure this guy wanted to punch me by the end of that conversation. You said you want to do it God's way. Let's do it God's way right? We got through that miraculously without being punched. And honestly, this is amazing to me. Later, they would say to me, Ron, we're so grateful that you said that to us because we were doing it God's way. We could say no to the world's way, but we could say yes to God's way. And that actually paid off in our marriage later. When the desires were there for something else, we could say no, and we could trust that each other could say no. But we could also say yes to God's plan. See how that works? He redirects your life down the right path. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, the the shadow of death, right? That's what some of your versions say. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice that David begins to talk in first person again. He to you, from the Lord is my shepherd, and he restores my soul to you are with me. Interesting. He stops in the middle of the psalm at his lowest point, and he stops there, and and as if he stops talking to the audience, he lifts his eyes to heaven to God and says, even in the worst places, you're there with me. I'm not afraid. I'm going to trust you. Because you are with me, I'm going to trust you. The shepherd, because of your presence, I fear nothing. I don't need anything. Now, he's not just proclaiming what and who God is. He's acknowledging that God is personally with him personally with him. I want you to see, I think, a next picture here. Is that up there, Aki? Picture, yes. A picture of a sheep here, and you see the shepherd's crook? You remember the shepherd's crook, that big thing? You know, it's easy to know what the hook is for, right? What's that for? Get the person off the stage? No, that that thing's for getting sheep out of the briars, right? Rescuing the sheep. It's a picture of God's grace. Then the other side could be turned around, and it's used as a club, And the shepherd would use it to fight off these predators, to whack anything that wanted to get at the sheep. So what do you have in God's rod and staff? The rod, protection. His staff, to bring you out. His grace, again, rod is his power. His staff is grace, his grace. So in the valley, you've got God's power and his hand working in you and through you and his grace In the other hand, working in you and through you. And he reveals his presence and his power in the shadows of life. You need to understand this. This is when he most wants to show himself to you. So if you're in a difficult time today, you are a great candidate for a revelation from God. He says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, what is a valley? We live in one. A valley is between what? Some mountains, right? It's a low spot between two mountains. It's dark. It's a low place. The sheep, think about the sheep, in the valley. The shadow comes. 
The darkness comes, and they think it's going to turn to night, so what do they become? Fearful. Fearful. And just like us, when we go through a dark valley, we become fearful of what's going to happen. We get anxious. We get depressed. We get overwhelmed. Listen, if you're in a valley, it just means, it just means that another mountain is coming, but you must get through the valley. My dad used to say, son, when you're going through hell, keep walking. Don't stop. Don't wallow in your pity or your complaining. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep walking. You've got to get through the valley. Your valley is just a mountain waiting to happen, but you got to keep walking through the valley. I know when you're in the valley, listen, it's hard. It's hard. The, the sheep couldn't see the S-U-N, but what's hard for us is that we can't see the S-O-N. We take our eyes off of him, and that darkness seems overwhelming. God is there in the dark place, in the valley, in the dark place, and it's easy to focus on the shadows instead of the shepherd. When you're in a valley, focus on the shepherd and not the shadow. You got that? Focus on the shepherd and not the shadow. Man, it's so easy for me to get up here and say, so much harder for me to live out. Reminds me of the little boy who went to the zoo with his dad, and uh, they went to the lion's cage right there, you know, with the lion's exhibit, and this big old burly lion comes up, and he's, Rawr. and the boy just like bolts in fear, and is just yelling at the top of his voice, the lion, the lion, the lion, the lion, the lion, dad, run, it's the lion, the lion, that's all he could hear, and his dad said, son, stop, I'm not focusing on the lion, I'm focused on the cage. <laughs> Some of you need to focus on the cage. You're fearful. Because you're looking at the lion, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He's just a kitty. We serve one who's greater. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And though your circumstances may appear that he's winning right now, hang on, walk through the valley, keep walking, focus on the shepherd. Some of you are confused you're not sure, sure who the shepherd is. You're still trying to figure that out. I'm going to give you some clarity this morning. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The enemy, the enemy is this. Anything that threatens your security. Anything. It could be a person, a thing. It could be, it could be the devil himself. What do you do at a table? When you go to a table today at lunchtime, you're going to do What? You're going to eat. Some of you are like, I play cards. Anyway, you're going to eat, and you're going to have fellowship, or you're going to hang out with others. You're going to talk. It's a time to spend time with people that you love. David is saying, in the middle of all that's going on, and the, the very presence of the enemy was threatening him, his security, he's sitting down with God at the table. I'm secure. I know who my father is. I know who the shepherd is, and he holds my future in his hands, and he's satisfied, and there's peace that comes with that. Because why? Because God is his source. He's not looking at the resource. He's looking at God at the source. You say, wait a minute. If God's really David's shepherd, why does, why does he even have enemies? Doesn't the shepherd supposed to fight off the enemies? That's a great question, but li literally, David's not focused on that. He's focused on the fact that there are enemies right outside his door, the thing that threatens his security. He rests in joyful rest because he knows who he's sitting with. You know who you're sitting with? Do you know who you're sitting with? He reminds you of his consistent provision and protection. Let me remind some of you of who you're sitting with. You're sitting with the maker of heaven and earth. We've covered this the last two weeks. You're sitting with the one who literally, who literally helped his people get out of Egypt, all the plagues and everything else, the one who literally created uh, all the sands on all the beaches, all the coastal beaches that we see around here, all the sands. He created all of that. And, and, and those don't even outnumber the thoughts that he has for you. You are sitting next to the creator of the universe. Let it sink in. Let it sink in because what does a lost job mean to him? He can do it. What does the fracture in that relationship mean to him? He can heal it. He can redeem it. Our God is an awesome God. I know Rich Mullins made that popular, but I'm telling you, God is amazing. That's who you're sitting at the table with. 
This whole idea of oil, he, he anoints my head with oil. I want to come back to that because I think some of you need to hear this this morning. Again, this goes back to what Keller would say in his book. Oil represents holy, the Holy Spirit. The oil for the sheep would take care of all these pesky little uh, mosquitoes and, you know, all the insects. So he put oil on his head to get rid of all the insects. That's one. Secondly, it would also heal cuts that would get on the sheep because sometimes they would get cut. They don't have hands, right? They're just hoofed, uh, clove footed or whatever. And uh, they get bruises on their skin and they would get diseases. So oil would help do away with those and heal those up. And then thirdly, when it was mating season, have you ever seen two rams, you know, come together and like, whoa, they put oil on his head, their heads and their horns so that the friction would be less and they just slide off. Otherwise, they kill each other. Sort of like us as human beings. We need the Holy Spirit. Listen, we need the Holy Spirit sometimes to help us with just the nagging things of life. Those besetting sins the Holy Spirit helps you with. The disease of sin itself. And for when it comes together to be able to forgive one another when there's conflict. How many people need a little oil in your home? You know, okay, you're honest. That's good. The rest of you, you're in church. Okay. <laughs> so again, when we look at these things, David is saying here, David is saying here, listen, look who you're sitting with. The maker of heaven and earth who sent his son to die for you on the cross, that when you were his enemy, when you were far from him, dead in your sins, God rescued you. He didn't just give you a new game plan. He wasn't your life coach. He rescued you. You were dead in sin. That's who you're sitting next to. And he anoints your head with oil. All right, that's an awesome thing. He goes on to say, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Follow me all the days of my life is an interesting phrase in the Hebrew. It literally means chase me down. You've heard of the hounds of heaven? Chase me down. God's got a couple of dogs, a couple of sheep dogs, if you will. His goodness and his loving kindness, his has said, his has said love. Loving kindness, his love for us and his goodness. And he's following you. He's, he's chasing you down. He says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's, he's eager to surround you, listen, with his love and his goodness. That's the shepherd always behind you. So follow him, yes, but he's always behind you. You're saying, what, God's following me? I thought I was supposed to follow him. Actually, he's always coming around you. And he's chasing you down. He's creating goodness and blessing in your life in the middle of misery. According to Psalm 23, God is always following you. He's always making beauty from ashes. He's always taking, making triumph from tragedy. That's what God does. He rearranges his mercy through your mess. You got some mess? God's rearranging his mercy. This is Romans 8, folks. All things working together for our good. God's following me? Yes. He's rearranging his mercy through that cancer, he's given you a new perspective of life. Through that breakup that ripped your heart out, young person, he's opening a whole new way of life and God's blessing for you. A lot of prayers that if they've gotten answered, boy, would life be different. Here's what I mean. Think of that high school sweetheart that you did not marry. Boy, would life be different, right? Thank God for unanswered prayers. Sometimes, okay? To be honest, there are some chapters in life, I got to tell you, I can't explain what's going on. And it's difficult, and it's hard, and it's hard to have tangible evidence that God is good. When you lost in such a way that you have no place to turn, and you come into a church like ours, and you're thinking, I feel like I'm so much on the outside. I want you to know all of us have been there. We've all had our hearts twisted and mangled by life. We want you to come home. We believe here that Jesus is home. This church celebrates Jesus Christ and his word. And what he did for you on the cross was to give you a way back home. He was the ultimate shepherd and your dependence on God, listen, is more important than your understanding of how it all works together. It's so important for you. 
Your dependence on God is more important than your understanding of how it all works together. Hudson Taylor says this, the great missionary to China, he says, God wants you to have something far better than riches and gold or personal charisma or talent. And that is helpless dependence upon him. Are you here? Do you have an unanswered prayer? If you do, can I just encourage you? Sometimes your request is wrong and God says no. Sometimes the timing's wrong and God says slow. Sometimes you're not ready and God says grow. But listen, when the request is right, it's the right timing and it is right request, and you're ready, God will say to you, go. You can trust him. Isaiah 53, 6 says this. Look on the screen. We all like, like, like what? Sheep. We have gone astray. Who? All of us. All of us in the sound of my voice who are listening online right now, out there in the courtyard right here, we have all gone astray. Each of us has turned to what? Whose way? Our own. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin, the toxic behavior was laid upon him. Who? On Jesus, right? For all of our sins were laid on him. Not just one of us, it's all of us. And if you're here today and you're, you're thinking, I don't know, I, I don't know even know why I'm here. I ended up here. Somebody invited me here. And maybe you're realizing that through all these circumstances, God in his loving kindness has been chasing after you. And he's trying to get your attention because you're headed for a desperate place without hope. And he's offering you today hope among hope. All the kind of hope you could ever need and want. And it's not just like a hopeless jar. It's filled with his goodness and mercy that will follow you all the days of your life, but you must receive his love and forgiveness. You must metanoia, change your thinking about God, turn around and face the Lord and say, forgive me. I want to be one of your sheep and I want you to be my shepherd. I've been leading myself far too long. So I confess to you, you are my Lord in Jesus' name. Simple prayer like that. Maybe some of you are here today and you're in a tough situation. Can I just encourage you with Jesus' words as the greatest shepherd? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you... You need some rest? Are you tired? You overwhelmed? The great shepherd says to you, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Stop the endless striving. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can we all just run to Jesus this morning? Let's pray. Father, we all as a church, God, we come to you, and great shepherd, we recognize our need as sheep, helpless, vulnerable, needy, We confess to you our need for you. So great shepherd, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would touch every heart by your grace in this place, outside in the courtyard, online that's listening. Draw your people to yourself, Lord. And Father God, I pray for those who have never come to you that they would pray that simple prayer. Please forgive me. Jesus, I know you died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. I want you to be Lord of my life and I commit to following you now. Be my shepherd. And for those of us this morning, God, who are struggling because it's difficult right now, we can't see the big picture, we put our trust in you. and We confess to you, you are the way maker. You are the one who, when there's no way, makes a way. We ask that you do it in our hearts, Lord, and give us that faith to continue to trust you even in the valley. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen.